Once more, the passages, they are Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, Romans 7, Romans 7, and 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, oh, 2 Peter, excuse me. Thank you, ma'am. 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. All right, tonight... I'm going to talk to you about top seven, tops, uh, top eight, top eight embarrassing moments of Steve Furtick. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of Steve Furtick, but his church is called the Elevation Church. Ooh, you know, Elevation Church. The Elevation Church is started to gain its popularity on the, during the pandemic, actually. His name and his church became a huge popularity uh, at the year 2020. And then he, uh, he got connections with T.D. Jakes, Joyce Myers, and a lot of big shots. He's actually, I could be wrong, but I believe he's my age, actually. So he's not that old, but he's already popular. The reason why is because our generation is an entertainment generation. They are a kiddie generation. So they get drawn to preachers wearing fancy, you know, sports shoes, and then leather jackets, and cool worship services, and you get... 40, 50-year-olds who are drawn into those type of services. But then you get those young crowd, and it appeals them. So then they tr attract the younger crowd to their services. So Steve Furtick is a big name. His, he hit New York Times bestselling author with his books. And sometimes uh, you hear me talk about top seven most embarrassing moments of Steve Furtick. So I'm going to tell you top eight, excuse me. So top eight, and some of what you're going to hear is unbelievable, all right, on what Steve Furtick actually said. That's a total embarrassment that he's getting a heat a lot of Christian pastors. So this is not just from yours truly. Other Christian pastors are critiquing him for what he said. Very controversial, and these are some of the eight things that are, is heinously embarrassing and face palm, all right, like this, okay? So let's talk about some of them. But before I talk about the top eight moments, uh, let me first explain Steve Furtick. If he is New York Times bestselling author, and if he is very popular, do you think he is rich? Well, of course he is rich, right? Of course he is going to be rich. So Steve Furtick got heat from people when he bought in a very expensive home in North Carolina. This is from WFAE 90.7, uh, declared as Charlotte, North Carolina's NPR news source. And the title of their article is Elevation Pastor Building Big Home in Waxhaw. Pastor Stephen Furtick, who has propelled Elevation Church into one of the fastest growing congregations in America, so he's already, he already hit over 20,000 members actually, guys. For some of you who didn't know. So he's growing super duper fast, this guy. Um, maybe, you know, if I, since I'm his age, I think no. there's still hope for me, right? Yeah. What, what do you mean no? Leather jacket would work fine, you know? You know, I, I can look like one of those Korean gay guys, you know, in those pop music, right? I can do that, right? I can do that, right? Okay, then. Jesus, give him glory, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Je okay, okay, I I'm losing viewers, okay, I better keep going, <laughs> that was pretty good, right, they always go low, you know, you know, Seth, they always go low, Jesus, all right, okay, so let's go back, uh, serious mode, all right, so let's go back. Uh, fastest growing congregations in America is building a 16,000 square foot gated estate on a large wooded lot in Waxhaw. Tax value on the 19 acre property, 19 acre property is 1.6 million. Uh, let's uh, skip on down here. Uh, Corbett also said the 16,000 square foot figure was misleading. 8,400 square feet of the house will be heated. The rest will be basement, attic, garage, and porch space. 
Uh, Corbett said, Furtick is paying. Ah, okay, so Furtick is older than me. So he was 33 this time. This was uh, like uh, 10 years ago, actually. My goodness, how embarrassing. He still dresses up like a 20-year-old. Okay. <laughs> Corbett said, Furtick, 33, is paying for the five-bedroom house with income from the books he's written and will write. So they're trying to justify that it's not tied to the church in any way. Okay, if you're a book uh, seller, okay, that's one thing. But it's really funny that Furtick said in a recent sermon that it's not that great of a house, he says. Oh, wow. Yeah, he actually says that. But it will be among the biggest in the Charlotte area, featuring 7.5 bathrooms and according to a building permit, an electric gate. Yeah, so th it's not that great, remember. It's not that great, guys. Furtick is suff uh, so there's a video from Vimeo, and it's kind of funny, the title of the video from Vimeo. title of the video is, Furtick is Suffering for Jesus, Enduring the, <laughs> enduring the Questions of a Reporter About His Mansion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what's suffering? And in that video, he actually says, it's not that great. First of all, it's not that great of a house. <laughs> Man, what a guy, right? Now, the issue is not this. The issue is not, you know, if you want to use your books to buy yourself property or something, that's one thing, but that's not the point. The point is the sign of a false preacher is the tendency is that they always become rich. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. There can be some right preachers who can get a lot of money. Don't get me wrong about that. But the average way, the normal see how God sees false preachers, the first sign is a lot of money. So if you see that, it's not accusing Steve Furtick of he has a lot of money, he's a false prophet. That's not what I'm saying. It's that if he has a lot of money, I wonder then if he is a false prophet. Why? Because a false prophet is known by false doctrines, wrong doctrines. So through his wrong doctrines, the Bible says that those false prophets should get a lot of money for it. So that's how we examine Steve Furtick. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. And let me know if I'm out of bounds, all right? Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who pr privily shall bring in damnable heresies. See that? Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be what? Evil spoken of. Truth is evil spoken of. <clears throat> and through covetousness shall they with what? Fain words make merchandise of you. Furtick is known as to be a great speaker, guys. That's why he builds a big church. He's, that's why he's very influenced by T.D. Jake. See that? Because T.D. Jakes, if you heard him preach, that guy can talk. That guy can talk. Same thing with Joyce Meyer and a lot of other prosperity gospel preachers or charismatic preachers. But the funny thing is that he graduated with the masters from a Southern Baptist denomination, if I recall correctly. So that's pretty funny, huh? The Baptist. So he's not like, you know, the Baptist, Southern Baptist, like Charles Stanley and those guys. This guy is your typical Hillsong mixture with... Rick Warren and uh, some prosperity gospel charismatic speech. Here's another passage in 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, verse 15, 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Boser, who loved the wages, see that? Wages of unrighteousness. Verse 18 for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, see that? They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Now, some critics might say, well, Steve Furtick, you know, he is a safe Christian. Are you accusing him of being a lost person headed for hell? That's not what I'm saying, and that's not the point what I'm using from this passage, all right? I'll, uh, what, if he's saved, then he's saved. If he's not, then he's not. I'll just leave it that way. That's between him and the Lord, and uh, I can't uh, speak for him, but I do know from this passage, it is disturbing that from this passage, why does Steve Furtick 
Follow the example of unsaved, lost, false prophets who teach wrong doctrine and through great words make a lot of money. All right? So that's the question that I'm bringing up. He doesn't have to follow their lost condition and head for hell, but why does he follow their pattern of getting money through great speech? Well, Furtick is not that way. Well, let's see. The sign is when they, through great speech, they teach wrong doctrine, right? That's what this passage shows. So through that, then we can determine if Steve Furtick is a false prophet or a false preacher. He can be sincere. He might be a good guy, and they boasted that they donated millions, millions to the city and to charities and etc. But it doesn't matter about all that kind of stuff. The point is, do you teach right doctrine? Do you teach yeah. right doctrine accordingly to the scriptures? So let's look at uh, eight classic, and I mean very embarrassing examples, all right? Very embarrassing examples. We're going to look at uh, Isaiah 14 first. I just want to throw this part in. So his church is called the Elevation Church, okay? And there's a thing where uh, exegesis is where you're reading from the scriptures and interpreting directly from the scripture. Eisegesis is where you're putting self-interpretation, reading into a passage that's not, that doesn't say. But there's a new term that's coming on, and they call this narcissus. In other words, this is a narcissistic person like I, I, me, 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 but he puts himself into the text. And unfortunately, Steve Furtick is infamously known for doing that. If you doubt me, just listen to his sermons. He puts himself I, I in a lot of texts, and some of them is where you would think it's disturbing and blasphemous and plainly wrong doctrine. So... If he's all about that I, I, I mentality, it makes sense why he's a motivational type of speaker for Joel Osteen, similar to Joel Osteen. It's all about me, me, me. So that's his, the theme of his church is to elevate the self. That's why it's called Elevation Church. See that? To elevate the self. Wait a minute. Who likes to elevate me? Who try, uh, Elevate is similar to a word with ascend. Elevate is ascending. Me ascend. Me elevated. Satan. Look what the Bible says in verse 12. Lucifer, right? Is that Lucifer speaking? All right, what did he say in verse 13? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will. You see how he's elevating higher and higher? Lucifer's mindset is elevation. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And the most blasphemous part, I will be like the Most High. Well, Steve Furtick didn't say he's God. Well, we'll come back to that later. But the point is right here is that that's that mentality of elevation ascending, right? Yeah. How about that? Uh, you know, maybe if you look at the other modern Bibles, maybe they'll, they might say elevate. If they say that, then that might be more disturbing. All right? You better thank God that we are King James only. If we weren't King James only and we'll, we pulled up modern Bibles or, or the original Hebrew, I bet you I would have found the word elevate. All right? People criticize us for being King James only, but sometimes, you know, we're saving your lives when, <laughs> when we're King James only. Amen. All right, Romans 7. Romans 7. Now let's examine some of the top eight embarrassing moments. Uh, one of the statements that he said, which he got heat for, and he deleted it from his Twitter, actually. So he deleted, deleted his Twitter because he got a lot of heat on this one. He posted or he tweeted, following Jesus doesn't change you into something else. It reveals who you've been all along. What would it be like to see the you that God sees? What? What? It's from his uh, actual sermon called Yes, You. See, it's all about, remember, Brother Sean, the candy cane in your heart? Yeah. You. It's all about you, brother. See, that mindset is wrong. Yeah. 
obviously, when you're following the Lord Jesus Christ, serving Him, it's not always the same you that you've always been. See, they do that to make you feel good, right? So that you don't feel guilty about yourself. And no, there has to be improvement, obviously. We all know that we, there's a lot of gunk in our lives that we need to clean up, bless God. But uh, no, uh, people don't like that. That's why they like to hear Steve Furtick not preaching about you are rotten, Amen. you are messed up. Yeah. See, that's very negative to them. Well, look what uh, Paul says. I mean, he uh, really elevated himself at Romans chapter 7. At verse 18, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good, no good thing. What? Yeah. Talk about an elevation church message. <laughs> look at verse 24, O wretched man that what? I that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, that ain't elevation right there. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Now notice right here that the Bible says that the old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Why? Because God gave you His Holy Spirit. So now there's a new life within you born from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit nature is not going to adapt or flow with how your old nature is, with your fleshly nature. Yes, you. No, it's not that way. Yes, you. Wow. See, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? Well, it makes you feel good. Yes, you. Imagine if I title my sermon that. that you know, this Sunday I'm going to title it, No, You. You know, maybe I should do that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Yeah, yeah on that one, brother, right? Yeah on that one. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No, it's not, it's always been you all that time. No. Man, imagine if Brother Sean was him all that time. Oh my goodness, it would be a horrible thing. Imagine if some of the other people in this church were the, I mean, man, it'd be horrible, right? It'd be horrible. It would be interesting though, I think, you know? <laughs> but it'd be horrible. <laughs> now, let's look at another passage right here. We're going to look at John chapter 16, verse 7. John chapter 16, verse 7. Thank God that there's a thing called sanctification in salvation. Amen? That you're able to put aside the old life and separate it from that into something new. Amen. What you're seeing, man, praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit nature working within people and you're seeing a new person, praise the Lord. Amen. This is what it's like to be in a Bible-believing church. Amen. This is what it's like to be clean, right, guys? Amen. Clean environment, Amen. you know. Being in a place is that's clean, away from your workplace, your school, you, even just the everyday area you're surrounded by just by walking outside, just to be separated from all that. Isn't yeah. that great, guys? Yeah. Man, Amen. that's why you retreat here. Some of you drive more than an hour to get here. Amen. Amen. Another heretical thing that uh, Steve Furtick said, which some of you don't know, the title of his sermon is called Ghosted. You know, Ghosted. So that's the title of his sermon. And that sermon ghosted, he said the following words. And the following words actually support a horrendous heresy. How many of you have heard of modalism before? Now, Bishop T.D. Jakes swings toward that way. So to be fair to him, I won't clearly accuse him of being a modalist, but a lot of what he teaches and says, it does swing toward that one. And this is what even Christian pastors are recognizing too. Aside from that, modalism, the idea is we believe one, uh, one God in three persons, right? That's what the Christian church believes in, one God in three persons. But they believe that it's one God and one person. So then what do you do with Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit who are three persons? What they claim is it's one person taking on three different roles. So then I can take the Father for one day and then switch to the Holy Ghost on the other day and then switch to the Son. See that? So it's like... Three different roles that you can take on. It's like, I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a father, and I'm a pastor. See, that's the idea. So it's one person, but he has three different roles that he can take. So that's a heresy. We don't believe in that. Well, look what Steve Furtick said. 
In his sermon, Ghosted, if you listen to that, he says this, No, I am not leaving you. So that's Jesus when he told his disciples, all right? When, remember when Jesus says, I leave you, I depart to go to the Father? So Ferdick, which is so shocking from John 14 and 16, the passages that he's using, that he quotes the opposite from Scripture. He says Jesus claimed this, No, I am not leaving you. I am changing forms. See, up until now I have walked with you, but when I send my spirit, I will be in you. So here's another quote, all right? Let's give a broader context. And now Jesus is taken from their sight and hidden in a cloud, but he did not leave. He just changed forms. He did not disappear. He just was no longer visible. Instead, he was internal. He said, it's good that I'm ghosting you. In other words, the Holy Ghost inside, all right? So he sounds cool, you know, ghosted, you know. So I'm ghosting you. It's good that I leave in physical form. See that? It's good that I leave in physical form because then I can give you in spiritual form. Then I can direct you from a deeper place. He didn't read John 16 right. Look at John 16, all right? So basically he's saying that Jesus Christ, when he went up to heaven, he's not in that form. He changed forms up in heaven into the Holy Ghost and then went down on the earth and went inside them. No, that's not true, all right? Because Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, they're separate persons. They're the same God, but they're separate persons. The Holy Ghost is in the people. Jesus Christ, yes, in that form, when he went up to heaven, he's still up there. Now look at John 16. Look what Jesus says in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I what? Go away, Steve Furtick, go away, all right? <laughs> Don't let him ghost us. Oh, it's creepy. The comforter, look what Jesus says. For if I go not away, so if Jesus does not leave them, then what? The comforter, that's the Holy Ghost, will not come unto you. But if I depart, see, if Jesus leaves, then what? I will send him unto you. Then the Holy Ghost can come. Then you can be ghosted, you know? So that's how it works, is that the Holy Ghost goes in them if Jesus leaves them. That's that urgent. But no, he was teaching, Jesus was just changing forms. Where did he get that from? But let's look at a lot of other passages. I didn't write these verses down, but... Look at these other passages. I'm going to show you a lot of proof here. Look at Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So remember when the Holy Ghost came down upon the people and he ghosted them? So this is the first time it happened, but look how Peter described this. Look at Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all our witnesses, therefore being by the what? Right hand, right hand of God exalted. Jesus is at the right hand of God up in heaven. Okay, guys? At the right hand of God on the throne. Now look at what happens. And having received of the Father the promise of the what? Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this. See that? So the Holy Ghost went down while Jesus went up. Keep reading. Verse 34, for David is not what? Ascended into the heavens. See, Jesus ascended up into the heavens. He didn't go down. But he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. Now look at this. He, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God until when? When's the due date? Jesus went up, changed forms, and went down and ghosted. No, sit on the right hand until what? I make thy foes thy footstool. Did that ever happen? No, it's in the future. All the world will bow down and bend the knee to Jesus Christ. So that means Jesus has to stay up there and can't ghost them. He has to stay up there until, until the time he makes the enemies his footstool. So Amen. guess what? Jesus didn't ghost us yet. That's what it means. Now look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. 
biblical illiteracy. That's what he is. I mean, he was reading. I'm reading from his main passages he used for his sermon. He wasn't even reading it. He wasn't reading it. I bet you he was reading a modern Bible version and it said, leave, that I will leave you. And that he just contradicted what he was reading from. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 1. Now look what the Bible says here. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We know who that is, right? That's Jesus. Jesus is in the right hand of God, up in the where? Heavens. Now look at this one. This is important. The Bible says in verse 4, for if he were, what? If, for if he were on earth and ghosted the people and ghosted Steve Furtick, he should not be a priest. You know what then? What Furtick did? He just said that Jesus Christ is no longer our high priest. What a Holy Spirit ghosted sermon he preached, didn't he? Oh, no, that is something that's heretical. Yeah. That's, I'll tell you, yeah, it was a spirit, but it ain't Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right? And it ain't the Holy Spirit. It ain't Jesus Christ changing forms through the Spirit either. Yes, it was somebody else. Right. Somebody who loves wrong doctrine. Someone who loves to contradict Scripture. I won't say it for you because I might offend some of the onliners. You just think about that and pray about that for a while. But I think you know. You just don't want to say it, do you? Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Good Matthew chapter 5. Good now, I'm giving you uh, documentations from his sermon so you can all look up his sermons and see, okay? You all can look up his sermons and see. But here's another sermon that he preached which taught another heresy. He actually posted on his Facebook, uh, God broke the law for love. So that was the title. Now, I don't even need to quote. That already contradicted scripture, okay? But it's such a cool title, right? That's the thing is that these charismatics, the dangerous things about these people, that's why they're good speakers, right? Like Peter warned you about feigned words, right? It's through such clever wording, such cool wording, rad wording, ghosted wording, stuff like that, that you con totally contradict Scripture. He's not thinking. He's just speaking freely. You notice that? Yeah. He's just speaking freely, however his flesh and mood goes, without proper prayer and being scriptural about it. Uh, he says right here, which is uh, so messed up about... His sermon, God Broke the Law for Love, which is already contradictory. I don't even need to show you scripture because you all know, but I'll show it to you because we have to be biblical. But he says, what God did when he sent his son, he broke the law for love. And then he tried to use an example. So clever, you know, it's so clever, but it's humanism, human intellect. He says, let's say you have a son that's dying. You love that son so much. I guarantee all of you broke the law. If you were to take your son, put him in your car, the law said speed limit, 55 mile per hour. You all would break the law for love. Bless God, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, when he came down, and glory to God, he broke the law for love. And everybody's like, Whoa, glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, maybe speaking in tongues or something like that. But you see, that's, the, that's that emotionalism hype yeah. that he's using. Now look, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with, you know, feelings in a church service, but feelings cannot contradict Scripture. That's so important. And not only that, feelings cannot just be feelings. It has to be scriptural. That's very important. I mean, our church, you know, we believe shouting. You know, we believe in using good wordings. I mean, talk about the... Preachers from the South, right? They've got good, pre uh, they got good sermons. They can flow with the words, catch, uh, give fancy titles. Look at my YouTube video, catchy titles, right? But the thing is, is that is it scriptural? That's one thing he's not looking at. Matthew 5, it's pretty plain. It's unscriptural. It's contradicting scripture. Verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law, 
Is that what Jesus said? Yeah. See, he didn't break the law. Or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, see that? But to what? Fulfill. Fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth path, what pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Yeah. See that? Jesus Christ, his job is not to break the law, but to fulfill it. Now, it looks like breaking the law, okay? So let's go by his human rationale. I'll even dismantle his example. Going by human rationale, it does appear like, you know, as we are wicked and we are sinners, that because of law, uh, because of love, God died for us so that he doesn't make us guilty according to the law. But it's a different thing if somebody else took that role. And because of that, somebody else who took that role, that person... Because of that person, he fulfilled the holiness of the law on our behalf, and God cannot condemn us guilty. Let me break, break his example. You ready for this? Let's say that it, a father can't do that for a child, but it was a police officer who cared for that child, took that child inside his car, and went over the speed limit. Guess what? That's not breaking the law. See that? It's trying to go by the law. See, so human rationality just doesn't jive with that. And by the way, no matter how much humane examples you can use, it doesn't top Scripture. You can pull up tons of examples, but it doesn't matter when you compare it with Scripture. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 now. All right, Romans chapter 1. Yep, you read it right. He actually said, God is energy. God is... What? Now, wait a minute. Who teaches that kind of stuff? The Eastern religions, right? Pantheism. You know what that heresy is? That New Age stuff? That basically God is in nature. God is in those things. That's why they'll say, you know, it's, you feel the energy. Duh, elevation. You, know, you feel that energy, you know, and they waken the divine in you, that New Age stuff, oh, yeah. that Eastern religious stuff. You got to watch out for that kind of stuff. So then you're trying to find the divine in energy. So this is found in his sermon. It's called uh, Focus on the Fruit. I don't know what to do. All right, that's the title of his sermon. I know some of you are laughing when I give the titles of his sermons, but that's how he titled it. That's how you get people into your church. Uh, this was during the pandemic. Uh, this was on May the 3rd, 2020. You can go to his Elevation Church YouTube channel. 2.33 million subscribers. But in his sermon on focus on the fruit, he actually said the heresy that God is energy. So let me give the quote here. God is energy. God is spirit. God is a molecular structure that fills all in all. That's what it means to say that Christ was from the beginning. Uh, no, look at Romans 1, all right? It is true, okay, let's, God is omnipresent, okay, we know that. God is, he can be everywhere. But it's not the teaching where, because God is a spirit, he's everywhere, see that? Because God is a spirit, he's everywhere. It doesn't mean that with every inanimate object you find, that there's going to be something God or something divine in that, all right? It's not like God is inside the raindrop. God is inside the tree. It's not that. That's not what God means. What God means is a simplistic manner that, hey, I'm just everywhere. He's not trying to dig into deeper. What does that mean? That means he's inside every little molecule. No, when you go that far, then you can deviate from Scripture and teach heresy like pantheists would teach. You got to watch out for that. And the Bible shows that is heresy to try to, uh, claim there's something divine in nature. Because look at Romans 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so, you know, all creation around us, it can manifest and prove God's power. But look what God says. God says in verse 23, about the people who wrongly did that and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into a what? Image. Image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
See that? God doesn't like it when they worship the creation. Look at verse 25, 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the what? Creature more than the creator. See, you can't teach that. If you teach that, then you're no different from a pantheist. That God is in nature. God is inside the creation. No, you have to separate the two. You have to separate the two. All right, let's look at another passage. We're going to look at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Yes, you're reading it right. He teaches that Jesus can't do something. All right? Now, don't play smart Alec with me. I know, you know, Jesus can't sin and stuff like that. All right? So I get that. But Steve Furtick doesn't say it that way. He teaches that there's something within human ability. Listen up now. There's something that human ability can do that can limit God's power. That's what he's teaching. So basically, man's ability overrides God's ability. So he teaches something heretical about that. I'm going to, it's from his Facebook. If you look at uh, Facebook, the title is The One Thing Jesus Can't Do. That's the title of it. And this is what he said. He claimed that Jesus could not release it. <laughs> uh, release what? So I'm going to uh, find it right here. He claims that because of people's unbelief, when people are not believing in Jesus Christ, his might and his power, that because of that unbelief, it automatically somehow limited his awesome, miraculous power. So healing the sick, raising the dead, he can't do that. Why were they able to bind God's power and override God's power? Because of their unbelief. So, his, so people's unbelief are able to override and to limit the, power, the mighty power of God. Who teaches that nonsense? That's just, that's just nonsense. No one, I mean, who would teach that unless there's another spirit that would like to teach that? You know it's not the Word of God and it's not Scripture. But, you know, his church will grow. You know why? Younger and younger generations don't even look at the Bible. That's why he can grab the next generations and his church can keep growing. Are you that person right now watching? You know, you can get upset at me and stuff like that, but I don't want you to look at my manners, my tone. People always judge me for that. You know, people who try to post videos about me, you know, judging me by my tone, by my sarcasm, you know, it shows how very biblically illiterate you are. You got to look at the scripture. You can't look at my personality, my tone. You got to look at the Bible. People got upset because I criticized one person and, and because I kicked their idol. Some of these uh, guys, they think they're so polite, they're prestigious because they're Calvinist and they love Calvinist preachers. And they're like, just look at him. You know, he just looks crazy. He's a nutcase. And, you know, they always catch me at those clips where I do my little rants, but they don't look at the scriptures that I show beforehand. You know why I rant and get angry? I don't rant like Jesus getting out a whip and beating people. But you know why we do that? It's not just ranting. There's a scriptural reason, and you have to investigate if I'm wrong or right about it. Amen. All right? Don't be some pansy, a sissy, a person who pretends to be an intellectual Calvinist but can't debate scripture about that one, can't examine the scripture about that one, and is such a coward that you have to find something on my personality to scare away people, shows how much polite you really are, how intellectual you are. You got to look at the Bible. You know, people might get upset at me about my arrogance and stuff like that, but the reason why I talk down, the reason why I talk down is I have zero respect for people who, uh, for people who gain the respect of onliners and the public in church who are poor sheep who don't know matter and say, what a nice Christian, what an intellectual, what a smart guy, and then they spout, spout out heresy and uh, doctrines that contradict the scripture. And then you think I respect that? No, I disrespect that. You know, you guys cheer me on when I kick the liberals, when I make fun of the liberals and the elites. But when I come across a pastor that you love, what's the matter? 
Why do emotions change? You know who should get it worse than the unbelievers? It's false pastors. You know who Jesus Christ condemned more? I don't think he condemned Caesar, who's a wicked pagan, or Herod. He did criticize Herod, but not as much as compared to who? Pharisees, pastors. All right? So don't judge me on that one. You say, stop being judgmental, Pastor Kim, Dr. Gene Kim. You know, stop, uh, stop being judgmental. No, don't you judge me. You read the scripture. Amen. Then you pronounce proper judgment. Okay. But anyway, this is what Steve Furtick claimed. The power of God was in Jesus, the healing power of God, the restoring power of God. The same power that made demons flee was in Nazareth, but Jesus could not release it because it was trapped in their unbelief. What? Like human might can trap the power of God. And there's one thing that even Jesus can't do. One thing that even the Son of God can't do. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. I see y'all looking at me like, is that true? I thought he could do anything. It said he could not. He wanted to. He was prepared to. He was able to. The power of God was in Nazareth, but it was trapped in their perspective. You see, that's the danger of talking freely like that without scripture. When you talk without Bible, you talk and spew out whatever because it sounds good and, you know, yeah, I just want to say amen to that. All right, let's prove him wrong with Scripture. Amen. Mark chapter 6 and verse 5. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and what? Healed them. Okay, he healed them. Verse 6, and he marveled because of their what? Unbelief. Wow, even in spite of an unbelieving community, he still did some power and miracles. It wasn't trapped in unbelief and he couldn't release it. Ugh, I can't do it. What in the world is that? What in the world is that? He's teaching heresy. It's not scriptural. Here's another one. Uh, he actually said, I am God, actually. I am God Almighty. That's what he said. He was caught for saying that. He was totally messed up. But you see the, what I showed you from the beginning about you, 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 narcissus, putting yourself in the Bible and then elevating me. And then Lucifer was elevating. And then later on, it came out of Lucifer's mouth, I want to be like God. But Furtick didn't say, I want to be like God. He said, I am God Almighty. Wow. All right, so... Yeah, so I'm going to play you a clip, okay? What we can do. And so in doing what we can do, other people will identify you by what you can do. And then they will limit you by what you can do. And then you will begin to think that you are what you do. And then you will lose yourself and gain the world. And Jesus said, what good is it? Don't let anybody put anything on you that will cause you to forget what God put in you. That goes for your struggles. See, I think Jacob, I think Jacob, his name, his name means supplanter, but his new name, Israel, is almost just as bad. It means struggles with God. Bad? Is what? Jake, Israel, Israel is a bad name. You notice that? They already contradicted scripture. And then you see these people going, amen, amen, amen. Like, it, no, God gave him a new name because Jacob is such a rotten name. Not, it, not his new name being just as bad as the old name. Why in the world? When God gives you a new name, bless God, when you got saved, it's just as bad as your old name? That is disgraceful, don't you think so? But that's that hype. All right, keep hearing it now. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. Yeah, it is New Age stuff, but you already saw that, right, with previously? See? But that's why Oprah can uh, commend Joel Osteen's book, because it's all related to New Age stuff, guys. This is all New Age stuff, this motivational stuff, you know, uh, all about the self, God in you, and stuff like that. Got to watch out for that mess. Wow, he said, I am God. Well, uh, let's look at Isaiah 14 again. Who said that? Okay. That... And you say amen to that, huh? And then I want you to go to Acts 12, all right? I want you to go to Acts 12, and I want you to go to Isaiah 14. 
How many of you got a blessing from that sermon? Amen. Can I get a raise of hands, you know? Man, messed up. How can people just say amen and get blinded to that? You know why. You know why they can say amen and get blinded to that? Because they don't know Bible, guys. They just came to a church so that they can hear something from the guy. They don't take a Bible, look at the Bible. By the way, online, don't get mad at me. Do you take out a Bible, look at the Bible, or are you just watching me? Take out a Bible, look at the Bible before you cast judgment on me and claim that Gene Kim is so judgmental. No, you stop being judgmental and take out your Bible before you act judgmental and cast judgment. Open your Bible and please look. All right? You can hate me, you can dislike me, all right? But as long as you get the truth and you look at the Word of God and you believe right doctrine, I think I'll be happy, okay? I'll be happy for that one. If there's anything my video can do on that one. If you don't like me after my video, fine, but if it gets you to truth, I'm happy. Look at Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. All right, I'll tell you who said that. Verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Sounds familiar? Yeah. Great uh, person who speaks well, right? And what did he say? And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. How about that, huh? Does that uh, remind you of somebody? All right, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Lucifer speaking at verse 12, right? What did he say at verse 14? I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. Elevation, church. I will be what? Like the Most High. All right, go to Romans 16. Romans 16. And we're going to look at Genesis 3. Look at Romans 16. And then I want you to turn to Genesis 3. Now, this is very, very plain and apparent with his narcissus, if I'm pronouncing or saying that word right. But it's like a new label. Basically, a person that puts himself into the passages. I mean, it's so horrible that you're now seeing where he's putting himself with God. You know, is that, that's a danger. That's a huge danger. You got to watch out for that. You got to flee Furtick. That's what you got to do. You got to flee from that guy. Now, this is proof that he's just speaking into Scripture and putting himself in there, okay? You can tell by his manner. So I'm going to play a video, okay? I, was, I had a first-time thing. I was stomping the devil's head on the stage last week. <laughs> it was at the 9.30. I was icing my heel between the 9.30 and the 11.30. I stomped him too hard, and he bit me or something. My, my heel is bruised. All week, somebody said, welcome to your 40s. You're going to start getting all kinds of <laughs> stupid injuries. What a way to get injured, huh? Stomping the devil's head for the glory of God. Come on, I've got hurt a lot stupider ways than that. It's hilarious. It's hilarious to me. It was funny to me. I used to get hurt punching walls and stuff out of anger. I'd rather get hurt anointed. Anyway. The Bible said that he will bruise your heel, but you will crush his head. That's a scripture verse. Whoa. See, that's clap. I told you, Narcissus. No, the Bible never said you. It's Jesus that stamps on the head. See, you're becoming, you're becoming God. Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's referring to Jesus. It's not referring to you. All right? You're not that important. It's not, yes, you. All right? It's not about you. Okay? It's no, no, and no to you. All right? No. All right? It's so scary. I know that, but you got to realize that. All right, go to Romans 16. Romans 16. This is very plain. And by the way, you can't stomp the, uh, the devil's head is going to get stomped in the future, the Bible points out. So what do you mean you can do something that Jesus did not 
fulfill in Scripture yet. He's going to do in the future. Yeah. Look at Romans 16. Romans chapter 16. But Satan, notice right here that in the future one day, he will be bruised before our feet. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says right here, uh, let's see, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan. See that? It's God, not you. Under your feet, what? Shortly. Shortly. See, it's not even now. So who bruised, uh, who bruised his heel then? <laughs> Himself? <laughs> he bruised his own heel. You know why? Because he was hopping like a bunny all that time, holding a mic, saying, Jesus, Jesus, you know, doing like that. That's why, he, that's why he hurt his own heel. He just did a foolish move. He just did a fool move. That's what happened. All right, go to Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. You know, uh, I, it's really sad how many people don't know Bible. When I say fool or foolish, they say, oh, pastor, you cannot say that, then you go to hell. No, Jesus said fools at the book of Luke. Paul even said fools at the book of Corinthians. When, when the Bible says about fool going to hell, this is why you need to know dispensationalism. Yeah. If you're curious, watch our video, Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis to Revelation. Your eyes might be opened yeah. after that. All right. For, uh, Titus chapter 1. So let's see if Steve Furtick qualifies for the ministry. Is he a pastor? <laughs> Look at verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed. See that? Self. Me, me, narcissus. Not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to what? Filthy, Filthy lucre. He got a lot of money, right? Look at verse 8. Uh, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. He has to teach sound doctrine. And what should he be at verse 8? Sober. You see that? That means serious. All right? It's not a kiddie church. Look at 1 Timothy 3. It's not a kiddie church. It's a serious position. People might say, you know, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us the way you dress? No, it's because I take the ministry seriously. That's why I dress this way. All right? I don't, I'm not going to wear a leather jacket. Sorry. Amen. All right? Because I take this ministry seriously, so I'm going to dress my best for the Lord. I mean, if people dress up like this for graduation, for liberal universities that hate God, I don't get it why I should, uh, I, that I dress less than them. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of wife, vigilant, sober, Right? Notice that matches with the deacons at verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be what? Grave, right here. So the K King James Bible words it grave, but it's very similar to what 1 Timothy 3, 2 is pointing out. Basically, you got to be serious. It's not a kitty kitty service. And if you look at Steve Furtick's service, guys, just listen to his sermon. There's no doubt about it. He doesn't fit in this. That's why he's unqualified for the ministry. So one pastor... Uh, said that he was unqualified. And you know what Furtick did? He said, so when I heard that, I was like, yes, Lord, I am unqualified. But God taught me that I use unqualified people for my glory, just like Moses. And then see, then the people go like this. And he wrote a best-selling book called Unqualified. That's what a way to get back, huh? And yeah, New York Times bestselling. And what? What is that? For wrong doctrine, for filthy lucre. Money. He fulfilled. He fulfilled the scripture of what a false prophet is. He just followed their example. Whether he saved or lost, the point is he followed that passage in scripture as 2 Peter 2, excuse me, as 2 Peter 2 and following their example. Now look at uh, his church service, all right? This is... You know, I like to illustrate stuff. It's because I love you. Gaston, aren't you glad you're watching on video? It'll be all right. It ain't sulfuric acid, it's just water. 
Now this is called the drenchinator. You see it? The drenchinator. And the drenchinator operates by <laughs> I'm praying about whether to follow through on this illustration. And I hear the Lord say, yes! I heard him say, go for it! Now, do you see that he qualifies well for the ministry? Sober, grave. Uh, he, he's a child. 40, he's older than me, and he still acts like a child. Isn't that messed up? So uh, he doesn't follow the scripture, guys. That's what you see. So you saw his most embarrassing moments, guys. That's Steve Furtick, and unashamed about his shame. That's one of the totally narcissists you can see. Trapped in his own world. He'll probably have to write another book after I do this video. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, I pray that we can see that there are false prophets arising. And it's so sad that as the next generation comes, this is the type of preachers they want, Lord. It's sad, Lord. They've lost their scriptural sense. They've replaced it with worldly entertainment. They replaced it with feelings. They replaced it with something that makes you feel good. Rather than the word of God, I pray that people tonight will have their eyes open if any have been caught away by this mess. And they won't be offended, but rather open their minds and their hearts to the word of God and be free from this trap that Satan has trapped the churches with money, self, worldliness, and entertainment, Father. Rather than the word of God, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.